Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll try and keep this um, as dynamic as possible so you don't have to wait too long for lunch. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I think this is a very um, interesting event and community to be presenting this to uh, because really it's this kind of community that is going to drive forward this initiative. It was about two years ago now in total um, that a lot of the challenges you're talking about today about how do we get these ecosystems going? How do we make it easier? But how do we address some of these issues that Luca was just referring to around still making sure that we keep in mind trust in the banking system or in the financial system more importantly um, that we can assure that. And so the, the IFC, um, which is part of the World Bank Group, it works with the private sector. Uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore here, which, as I'm sure all of you know, is very forward-looking and dynamic when it comes to promoting fintech. Um, and the ASEAN Bankers Association, which many of you may know, uh, regroups the 10 national banking associations across ASEAN. We got together and said, we're missing a part of the architecture to make this happen, so let's create it. And that's what I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about today. Um, how we got there and, and what it's doing. It's still early days, but very interested to get questions and feedback. Um, so that started, you can kind of just see by the images up there, um, with a focus not so much on solving problems here in Singapore or other mature economies, but really looking at the challenges um, and the opportunities uh, in a lot of the emerging markets or the developing markets across the region here. Um, countries like Cambodia and Laos, uh, Pakistan, Mongolia, Philippines, Indonesia, um, and even we're now covering some of the uh, less developed Pacific islands where financial ecosystems really are um, trying to leverage technology to get ahead. Um, but just I want to kind of go back a little bit to the, the context of this and what at least, and again, this is, this is where I'm hoping People can inform me a little bit more what's going on in the API economy. Um, we see this as actually the banks are playing catch up. You know, the, 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 it's always amazing to me how many different elements of the real sector are already living and breathing APIs. You know, everything from you know getting getting up to date information on the bus timetable and where my bus is to uh, what we see at the IFC now, really in areas like agricultural. Um, you know, using not just APIs, but technology to really reinvent how we do basic activities like farming. Um, and so, in contrast perhaps to some of the mature markets, here in a lot of the emerging markets around the region, the real economy has progressed much faster than the financial sector in onboarding and living in a, taking on this opportunity of new technology and the API frameworks that go with them. Um, and that's what's actually generating a demand for new financial services. You know, it's still about lending money, it's still about payments, it's maybe about insurance, but it, it needs to come in a different shape, a different size, a different color, you know, um, in order to meet the business models that actors in the real sector are developing. And you only have to look around here in Singapore and the region at companies like Gojek, or over in China at what Ant Financial has done to realize that if some of these real sector firms across the board don't find what they need from the banks today, they just think about creating it themselves. Um, but that's only a short-term solution, and the financial sector is now living up, is waking up and realizing they need to also be adapting the way they provide services to seize those opportunities. Um, and so that's now moving us into a sphere, of course, where the whole infrastructure is being built out. Some of it's already there, some of the technical infrastructure. Um, again, here in Singapore, it's fairly easy. Uh, if you go to Laos or Papua New Guinea, try to, try to find a regulated, compliant, scalable cloud architecture um, is impossible. Um, and so a lot of the gains from trade really in this area and the benefits are reliant on taking some of the scale both in technical and institutional infrastructure and making that available but also responsible to a lot of these other markets that are playing catch up to some extent um, and have actually opportunities to leapfrog. Um, so that's what's kind of drawn us into this space um, as partners from the World Bank side, the MAS and the ABA. 
is to try and bridge that gap, but to do it in a way where we are cognizant of some of the structural market challenges that we need to address in order to make this happen. And again, a lot of these things, I think, probably been covered over the last two days um, about you know, what, what this is doing to value chains and what it means in terms of the architecture and technology of banking. Um, and, um, and really, the emergence of then some regulatory challenges about authorization standards, guidelines, security, um, and also thinking a bit more clearly about how we make it possible for new fintechs to come into the market, to gain credibility, to demonstrate what they can do, but to do it in a way which is on a journey with the regulators to maintain the stability and the integrity of the financial sector. And this is very challenging for regulators um, that need to and should be maintaining sort of the legal coherence of their systems. Um, it's a journey. It's a journey we're on, and we're hoping to try and make that journey a little bit easier here across the region. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but needless to say, you know, this journey is impacting all sectors of the, all, all parts of the financial sector. So obviously you've heard a lot about banks going down this pathway, um, fintechs and, and the non-banks, um, I won't dwell on too much. And we heard quite a lot already just now from, from Luca about the different sort of both technical and legal frameworks emerging in different parts of the world, um, you know, across PSD2 um, and um, in the UK, for example. So I won't go back into those. I, I would emphasize maybe, though, one of the other things that I think is very important for us, again, looking at it from the public sector, is that a lot of what people want to do is also reliant or maybe presupposes that there's some digital infrastructure out there in public services. So you're, I'm sure everybody's familiar with, you know, the India stack, for example. Um, Luca made reference to the, this is, sorry, this is difficult to decide. This is the, this is the periodic table of APIs um, issued by the um, um, Banking Association here in Singapore with the MAS. Um, you know, a lot needs to happen in that space, whether it be credit bureaus or other parts of the architecture in parallel with the development of open API banking. Um, and so also there, both the MAS from a domestic perspective, but more importantly, the World Bank um, saw what we're doing here with AFIN and APEX as an opportunity to expose the public sector in many of these markets to some of the pragmatic challenges um, that they need to address in reforming or modernizing uh, public infrastructure in order to enable some of the private sector developments to really take root. And it goes down to basic things like how do I do a digital KYC when there are no digital laws or digital records in a country uh, that enable me to do that. So these are parts of the challenges that, that the private sector we found cannot solve entirely by themselves. Um, so we, we, we started to look at what on the supply side of all this technology environment we could leverage and start to address through a network and a platform some of the challenges, particularly on the demand side, um, that are hindering a more rapid and more secure rollout of some of these opportunities. Um, so some of the markets that we're addressing are just very small. They're small economically, they're small in terms of population. Um, a lot of the fintech solutions we see are in theory applicable to their context, but you know what it's like. The more this market becomes sophisticated, the more you need to adapt your solutions in very specific ways to market circumstances in, and, the, and the ecosystems there, or the lack of an ecosystem there. So we found that actually something that's 95% appropriate for a market like Cambodia or Indonesia, that 5% is actually hindering fintechs based here in Singapore or the US or Dubai or wherever to make that journey to actually penetrate those markets and help solve problems. And that's a missing opportunity. That's a market failure we want to try and address by bringing those markets closer to those solutions and make it easier for fintechs to understand and experiment and adapt to those local market circumstances. Um, some very basic things 
about market search, you know, looking for API solutions that fit your needs. Um, it doesn't, unfortunately, today happen just over the internet and over these platforms. There's a lot of business travel going on. There's a lot of discovery going on. And anybody here who's worked with a bank, I'm sure, can testify that it takes probably at least three or four meetings with about six different departments in a bank to even get to a position where you might actually be able to talk commercial business. Um, so this is a real big hurdle that we think is, is, is slowing down investment and opportunities here. Um, and then, of course, there are the, the, there's the journey, as I said, that the regulators are on in the region, thinking about how to manage this process in a responsible way and still taking care you know, of, their, of their fiduciary responsibilities. So that's kind of the context in which we set up AFIN. We set it up a year ago. Um, it's a membership-based organization, uh, at the moment a not-for-profit organization, a kind of industry umbrella organization that brings together stakeholders from across the region. Um, it's got a unique footprint, um, being able to leverage the networks throughout Asia of regulators that work closely with the MAS, through the World Bank and the IFC, um, and the IFC's network of banks and fintechs that it also works closely with, both from an investment perspective um, as well as in advising them. Um, and it's really been put together to not replace the market, but to give the market a helping hand and to crowd in all of the expertise from the technology companies, from the fintechs, from, from the other actors that are actually making this happen, um, this transformation and bringing benefits to these countries. Um, we set up here in Singapore, um, so it's a legal entity here in Singapore, um, and we actually launched at the Singapore FinTech Festival um, with Prime Minister Modi back in November. Um, so there's a, what does it consist of? It's, it's, it's a network. So we bring together a network of potentially 400 banks across 22 markets in Asia. We're operating for the benefit of banks that want to improve the way they provide financial services to their end customers in ASEAN, South Asia, Mongolia, and some of the Pacific Islands. Um, and it's a network which is open to fintechs globally. We're actively encouraging and seeking fintechs from all over the world that are interested in and capable of solving for some of the SME lending, financial services for um, households, for, for consumer affairs, for uh, remittances, anything you can think of really in the financial ecosystem and beyond. We really are interested in having firms sign up, demonstrate what they can do, get introduced to banks, and start to actually be part of an ecosystem which is there for, for testing, development, and deployment. Um, it's basically a sandbox. You can go on today, we, so it's, it's operational. It's in what I would call friends and family launch mode. We're still gathering feedback from the network, from the users, from the regulators about how we vet fintechs, how we display information, how we enable banks and um, fintechs to control conversations with each other, and how to make it much more user-friendly for a lot of the communities in these markets where there are, to be honest, a lack of skills, a lack of resources in both the development and the product design and deployment areas. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show you a little bit what, what is on the platform, um, but obviously afterwards feel free to go and sign up yourselves on the platform and, and browse a little bit what's on there. Um, the, the overarching aim, of course, from a business perspective is to make it a lot easier for financial institutions to really leapfrog from situations where they are today where Again, to be honest, it often takes six to nine months to even develop a pro prototype, to bring a business idea for a new product from an idea to an actual feasibility study where somebody can sign off on a budget to launch it. We want to bring that down to three to four weeks to be able to actually go on the platform, test feasibility, bring a product idea to your business manager in a bank, and start working actually on a deployment with a fintech. Um, and we're working also with banks that 
again, for no fault of their own, really lack infrastructure and they lack development capacity. We're working also with microfinance institutions and local banks in markets where they actually want to be on day one running all their operations on the cloud. They may not have a development environment that they can plug into and make available to a fintech to start doing prototyping. Um, and they actually want to leapfrog beyond legacy systems and start, start with services that are built already for this kind of ecosystem. Um, we did a little bit of work trying to understand what the actual economic and manpower costs are for developing new services. Um, you know, these are based on some studies that Deloitte did for us, uh, financial institutions here in the region. And the numbers are actually quite shocking, particularly if you come from um, a part of the ecosystem which is not the financial services sector, but again, from many of these domains for consumer services where, or if we look also what's happened in China, where people will indeed, you know, take on that ethos of moving quickly and being willing to break things. Um, people don't want to break things in the financial sector, but it becomes a hindrance to innovation. So the platform is really there to take financial institutions, enable them to publish to the world, or in a controlled manner, what they're trying to do, to start to move down that path towards integrating. So some, some banks are using the platform in a, uh, in a remote fashion. That is to say, they haven't connected it with their legacy systems, but they're doing product development and experimentation on the platform independently. Some of them are well equipped and have APIs that are published or that they'd like to publish, but they don't want to publish in an environment that isn't very secure or hasn't been authorized by the local regulators. And they're already then able to use the platform in between as a pass-through platform to connect fintech APIs with their own APIs and expose their APIs to other clients out there that are trying to develop products in this new ecosystem. Um, and we really focus on enabling this discovery, design, and deploy um, sort of process. We're not at this stage supporting production, so we're not supporting live um, API usage in the real economy. We hope very much that in a year or two, with the consent of regulators and with an reassurance and, a, and the confidence of the users that we will be able to move down that path bit by bit to actually become a live platform. But in the meantime, um, banks and fintechs will be using this to get more quickly to UAT. Um, I'll just, in the interest of time, skip over a little bit of this, but feel free. I think this will be available probably on the website, so you can come back to it in more detail. Um, for fintechs, just quickly, um, I think this is particularly, what we found talking to fintechs is that it is really quite a struggle, finding the right banks, finding the right parties, um, going through a lot of the hoops of due diligence, which is often a lost, a lost sunk cost. Um, bank A might ask you to do a, an evaluation of your technology or security. Bank B wants the same thing. Sometimes you can't reuse it. There's some very basic tangible benefits to being on the platform. And it's also a user-driven platform where we will, we've actively put together a user group or a user committee which will be helping to drive forward some operational guidelines, standards, and minimum criteria for being on the platform, or at least around the disclosure of operational and technical standards. So that this becomes a platform that the regulators can kind of look to and say, hey, if you're on this platform, it means at least that you're compliant or you're adhering to some of these basic standards that have been adhered to by not just the fintechs in the room, but also the banks that are part of this platform. And they've been doing that in conjunction with the support and the support of institutions like the World Bank and the MAS. Um, and we see this as an opportunity to fintechs to really much more quickly broadcast to the world what they're doing and bring down a lot of their market development costs and also prevent sort of what I would call bank capture. I, I think, again, I don't know how many fintech operators here in the room have had the experience of adapting their operating model to a specific bank and then finding when they get to the next bank that things have to change and that undermines a lot of their scalability. Um, so we launched, like I said, in, at the November, uh, at the FinTech Festival. This is a, a photograph of 
um, the, the booth we had here in Singapore, uh, we were really overwhelmed by the amount of interest um, and the footfall we had there. Um, and I think these numbers probably need a little bit of updating. Uh, we're probably closer now to 120 fintechs. Um, uh, we have about 40 institutions now signed up, but that are in various stages of technical onboarding. Um, and as I said, we, we're, we're open for business in 22 markets uh, for the financial institutions. Um, the platform is available at apixplatform.com. So AFIN is the name of the institution. That's the ASEAN Financial Innovation Network. Um, and AFIN runs the Apix platform. The Apix platform is actually then run technically by a company called Vertuza, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We went through a very rigorous process back in July and August, um, a competitive process in which we selected Vertuza and a couple of other parties to be the consortium to run this on behalf of AFIN and on behalf of the founding stakeholders, the founding members of AFIN. Um, here what you see is a short overview of some of the banks that have already signed up. Again, everything from very sophisticated banks like Union Bank of the Philippines or Standard Chartered that see this as something complementary to what they're doing in-house to maybe some of the environments, both technical and networks of fintechs that they put together. But there are also banks here um, like Axion and Aya Bank and Myanmar um, that are really starting from scratch and they're, they're part of the, uh, the early, early stages, you might say, of this learning process. Um, there's a broad catalog of fintechs. Um, as I said, we're, we're very keen to attract fintechs from various domains. When we started, we, we took to heart the concerns and interests of the financial community um, that said to us they were looking in particular for solutions for credit scoring, for KY, digital KYC, um, also for various kinds of SME lending, merchant lending. But very quickly since then, um, it's expanded. And we also have, I should emphasize, a dual role here for banks. So here you might see Solaris Bank, um, Solaris Bank being based in, in Germany or in the European Union, um, is here as an API publisher and as a potential service provider to help financial institutions in these 22 markets that we're covering. So banks can easily sign up as an API, API provider or publisher as well as an API consumer. Um, the, for each institution, we're going through checks. So if you're a financial institution, one of the key criteria is that, of course, you're licensed in one of these 22 markets to provide financial services. It's not just for banks. Insurance providers, mobile financial service providers are eligible. Um, and for fintechs, we have a, a due diligence process that we are still working on. Um, basically, we, need, we collect information about the institution to do our own KYC, um, but of course we also collect information that's required so that those fintechs can pitch themselves properly on the website. And again, we, we're, we're really, it's a really a, a user-driven network, so we anticipate publishing our roadmap of, of functionality and service design, consulting with the users on a regular basis to enhance the way things are presented, the way people can use the platform, and to talk really about the additional services that we want to roll out, whether it be of a technical nature to make design and development easier, but also things like plugging into the broader development communities out there. Again, this is not, this is not a network that's supposed to replace many of the networks and companies you're already working with. We want to make this the one stop that the banks in these markets can go to, to even find local development resources or foreign developers that can train the developers in the banks um, and, and to make this really a, a living network driven by the needs of the community. Um, what you can do is you can go through the FinTech catalog. If you're a bank, um, you would look for the kind of APIs and solutions that you're working on at the moment, maybe for an SME lending product. Uh, you could subscribe to those APIs. Again, I'm sure that everybody here in the room is fairly familiar with um, how an API manager um, system works. Um, you could subscribe to that API. We patch it into some of the business processes that you'd be working on as a bank. Um, 
you, once you've subscribed to an API, you could then draw it into your development framework. Um, and I'll just quickly jump ahead here in the interest of time. Um, you could then open up the IDE. You can see there, there's a, there's a page there to jump to the IDE. So we were running on Amazon Web Services. Um, if you don't have a testing environment yourself, you can use the testing environment, the IDE that's there. If you already have one set up, you can set up with your credentials and log in um, using your existing credentials. And then, and then you get into the actual development portal where all those APIs that you've just subscribed to, you can start to, to use in the development process. Now, I'm, I'm not a developer myself, but this is the area where you know, we're really keen to get engagement with the community to find out how we can make this not just easy for the, the, the best in the class developers and companies, but also begin to integrate many of those services that we know are in the pipeline that will make it easier for banks and fintechs in markets with fewer resources to, to do a lot more development in a more intuitive, um, in a much more intuitive fashion. Um, so that's, that's a very brief overview. I do hope you'll um, visit the website, and if you have any questions, I'm very happy to cater for a few questions. I don't know how much time we have left, but... We have time. Okay. We have time for questions. Big round of applause for Ivan. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. How much of the uh, candidates of the financial institution candidates don't make the platform? So our aim is really to build a balanced and very open network. So there are no, we, you know, unless you are, you know, working as a bank in North Korea or you're on the UN sanctions list, you know, basically we want you as a member. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Gregoire. Hi, my name is Greg from UEX InsureTech, and I wanted to ask you if your uh, you, you were part of the sandbox MAS things, or were you pushing InsureTech to be part of this? Uh, are you the right person to talk to if we want to be part of the sandbox? For example, we are doing fully online uh, health insurance, and we, uh, we never had any discussion with a regulator on that. So the question is, are you the right person to talk to, or do you have the, the ability to connect to, to the right person? The, what I would call the domestic um, MAS sandbox. Um, this, this environment, this initiative is there also to work with domestic institutions in Singapore. Um, but to be very honest about it, it's more about creating a regional market and less about trying to catalyze the domestic market here in Singapore. Um, if you see me afterwards, I can probably point you in the right direction of some contacts at the MAS. But that is a very separate um, from, from this initiative. And definitely, this is open to insurance. In fact, we're very keen to work with more um, insurance service providers um, across the region. Again, some of these markets are very challenging, um, but they still have a need for various insurance products, and there's a lot of market opportunity there. And that concludes the morning. Thank you, Ivan. Round of applause again. Thank you.